Welcome to Ceres, the closest dwarf planet to Earth. Today we're going to try to terraform it and talk about possible hazards that we may experience if we decide to settle on this beautiful dwarf planet one day. And we're also going to talk about the features, the history and the facts of this dwarf planet. Welcome to What the Math. <laughs> And let's start with a bit of history on how Ceres was discovered and what actually led to uh, its official classification as well. And let's start with a bit of history. So how was Ceres discovered? A person by the name Kepler has kind of noticed that there's actually a gap between Mars and Jupiter. And if you actually look at the ratios of uh, orbital radii, so for each planet, specifically Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then you look at Jupiter, you'll notice that it's like there's something missing in between. There's got to be something in between them uh, for this sort of ratio to continue. And so he proposed that maybe there was some sort of a hidden planet in between here, and we just haven't found it. So the early scientists predicted that within about 2.8 astronomical units from the sun, there might have been some sort of a hidden planet, but they didn't really give it a name and they actually didn't really um, specify any other details about it. They just thought that there's something out there that we haven't found yet. And so in early 1800s, specifically 1800, the year 1800, uh, a scientist by the name Giuseppe Piazzi uh, from Palermo, from Sicily, was hired to, to try to find this, uh, this hidden planet. And in 1801, he actually was able to observe it 20 times and he even um, named it. He named it after the Italian goddess from Sicily, Seria. And uh, this goddess uh, is also known as Ceres in English, and that is what the name is from. So he basically named her, or named the planet after her, after the, um, the goddess of agriculture. And there's actually a very old temple to this goddess uh, in Sicily. So he decided to basically kind of um, put a little bit of his own Italian culture into this name. And so there you have it. So this is how Ceres came to be. And today we know that Ceres is very likely to be a surviving protoplanet, so it's not a real planet, it's a surviving dwarf planet that actually would have formed a, a, an actual planet if it hadn't been for extreme mass of Jupiter right next to it, which actually is why the, uh, we don't actually have a planet here. So, because Jupiter is so close to this asteroid belt, it was actually able to dislodge most of these dwarf planets and either kick them out into the outer solar system or into our sun or possibly into other planets like Earth and Mars. Uh, and so, uh, it, what we have as a result is just a bunch of these asteroids orbiting around the sun but no actual planets. Ceres' diameter is not very big, it's only about uh, 476 uh, kilometers in radius or about 945 um, kilometers in diameter. And when it was found, uh, officially it was classified as a planet. But a little bit later on, specifically in 1850s, a lot more of the asteroids were actually found. And so this was the first time when scientists had an argument about astronomical bodies and what uh, they are and what defines them. And so they actually classified all of these, including Ceres, as an asteroid until 20th century. And it wasn't until 2006 that this was actually classified as a dwarf planet. And specifically, this is actually the closest dwarf planet to us and the only dwarf planet within the inner um, solar system. In other words, uh, within the Neptune's orbit. So everything after Neptune is uh, considered to be a trans-Neptunian object and there's a lot of dwarf planets in the outer system, specifically uh, Pluto and Aries and so on and so forth. But with, um, within this uh, inner solar, solar system, there's, there's nothing except for Ceres, there's actually no other dwarf planet. Now, we didn't actually know much about Ceres until um, the visit of Dawn mission in 2006 and now we actually know quite a lot, including uh, actual pictures of it, so this is exactly what it looks like in real life, and there's a pretty cool um, spot on the surface of it, which is very, very bright, it's actually right here, and we didn't really know what this was until very recently, so now we know it's actually ice reflecting from the surface, uh, but uh, there's a lot of really cool things about it that we know, specifically that it's actually basically a very dirty snowball, so in reality it consists of about 30% water, so it sort of is really like this even though it does look like that. Uh, so we're gonna have to take this in, in, into consideration when we're actually terraforming it. 
And because it's a dirty snowball, um, it's also very sticky and very, very um, slushy on the surface. So when something hits the surface of Ceres, it stays there, it sticks to it. And for this reason, NASA actually um, considers to go to Ceres to study some of the ancient asteroids and uh, ancient rocks. Basically, nothing really bounces off the surface. If something hits Ceres, it sticks to it and it basically stays there. So this might be one of the oldest chronicles of asteroid collision in the solar system because not only is it in the inner solar system and in asteroid belt, but it's also very sticky and so everything it just stays there. In other words, if I were to throw an asteroid at it uh, at a speed of what an asteroid would have in this particular region, which is five kilometers per second, it would actually hit the uh, dwarf planet and most likely most of the material would stay on the surface and not really fly away with, with some exceptions. Maybe some of the stuff would fly away, but most of it would actually be still here. It's also very likely that the inner part of this particular planet has a lot of water in it and possibly even liquid ocean. There's actually been quite a lot of theories about liquid ocean um, underneath all of this ice. And if there's liquid ocean, there might be also life. And so there's also theories that speculate that maybe life did come from Ceres um, and landed on our planet at some point because because Ceres may also have a lot of collisions with asteroids since it's part of the asteroid field. And whenever an asteroid collides with Ceres, some of the fragments, as you just saw one right here, and also all of these fragments, might actually carry some kind of a life or something to other planets and other parts of solar system. And the surface of Ceres is actually not very cold. Uh, it's only about minus 30 degrees Celsius in the sun, and that's without much atmosphere. So um, even if we were to land here, we wouldn't really need much to warm it up because it's already relatively warm because it's relatively close to the sun. So it is, it is getting quite a lot of heat from the sun. And also there's other things on the surface and inside of Ceres specifically, there's things like ammonia, there's sulfuric acid, there's um, all kinds of solutes and all kinds of materials that will allow us to basically terraform this and use a lot of the things to create an atm atmosphere if we decide to land on this planet or dwarf planet. But the only problem, of course, is that it's so tiny. In comparison to even the moon, this is actually a, such a tiny world. So here is Cer Ceres compared to Pluto. You can see it's actually a lot smaller than Pluto. Now here is Ceres compared to Sedna, relatively similar size. Here is Ceres compared to our moon. Look at that. Look at how small it is. Our moon can basically fit 100 of these inside. So it's very, very, very tiny and very small. This also means that the gravity on the surface of Ceres is only 0.2 meters per second square, which is uh, something like 40 or even 50 times smaller than the gravity on Earth. In other words, if you jump up, you can jump really high, up to 50 meters high. And for this reason, keeping the atmosphere on the surface of this dwarf planet might be difficult because a lot of it might just fly away into the outer space. So we have to create some kind of a super heavy breathing atmosphere that we can survive in. And let's just say we just did that. Let's just say we invented that and now we can create atmosphere on the surface. So since this planet is already relatively warm, we're just going to uh, start melting things on the surface and create a lot of greenhouse gas. And we're going to start increasing its atmospheric pressure. And so here we go. And right away it started getting a little bit of color and as we increase the atmosphere it will start getting more and more gases on the surface that will then start warming up the planet. At about 80% of atmospheric pressure we can already actually live on the surface and not explode and not die because this is enough for us to survive. And uh, we already got a little bit of greenhouse effect as well but that's unfortunately not enough for us to be comfortable and to live and survive on this dwarf planet. And as the water ice starts to melt, we start getting clouds. You can actually see them right there. There is there, there. And uh, the atmosphere and the clouds basically start circulating around, creating even more greenhouse effect. And uh, all of this water ice starts to melt even more. But because there is like 30% of the mass as water, this planet will eventually become a very large water world. And we're going to simulate this by basically making 30% of the mass as water. 
And then as soon as we get a temperature of about um, zero degrees or over zero degrees, this is what happens. This will become a water world that we then can live on. Except, of course, we have to try to make some kind of a floating platform or a floating colony because otherwise we're just going to sink and the oceans here are going to be really, really deep. So currently the temperature is about 5 degrees Celsius, a little bit colder than Earth, but you know what, this is comfortable and not very uh, not very hot. So this is a world that uh, has uh, something like 9 hour days, so in other words, you'll always have an average temperature of about 5 degrees Celsius or even more. And one year here lasts about 4.6 years. But here is actually an interesting question that many people ask about series usually. How often do asteroid collisions occur here, considering the fact that this is actually in the middle of an asteroid field? So we can simulate this by basically adding asteroids using the uh, rings command here. And we're going to add them at a distance of about uh, 3.8 billion to about 5 billion kilometers. And we're going to add about a few thousand of them at a mass of about, total mass of about one, one moon, one earth moon. And here we go. And also we're going to make sure that the shape here is torus so that it's more realistic. Okay, here's one. Let's add a few. Let's actually add maybe three, uh, four. Okay, this is, this is going to be 10,000 asteroids um, orbiting in a similar sort of location as Ceres. And as you can see, this is actually, looks relatively scary now. So, uh, sort of in the middle of this huge asteroid field where it looks like maybe some of them kind of could one day collapse into Ceres and then cause some damage. Now, now interestingly, there is actually a paper from the 1990 that describes the mathematics and the probability of a very large collision that could cause a lot of damage on Ceres and shows a specific probability uh, of this happening. Now, just to save you some time, uh, I'm going to give you the actual number and the number for an actual collision to occur is very, very small. The, the chance of it happening is like 0.0000000008%, which is very low. In other words, it's kind of like having a very large collision maybe every million years or so. And by large collision, I mean a rock that's about maybe 20, uh, 30 kilometers in size. So something along the size of like this big maybe. So let's just actually just, uh, I'm gonna show you what this looks like when one of these rocks decides to visit and the speed of collision will be about five kilometers per second because that's the relative velocity of these rocks here. So here we go, it's going to start here and this is what would happen. So there will be a very large collision that would maybe cause a lot of damage. Uh, if there was a colony, it may likely to be destroyed and there's going to be tsunamis everywhere and uh, things will not look good. But um, smaller rocks, if there is an atmosphere on Ceres, will actually just uh, dissipate and burn up in the atmosphere and they will not do any damage. So a smaller rock that's only about let's just say about 100 meters in size even, and that's that's really large actually, even less than 100 meters. A rock like this will most likely just um, burn, burn up in the upper atmosphere and will not really do much damage. But even these collisions happen very, very rarely. A collision like this might occur maximum once per year, not even. Uh, so even though there is so many asteroids in the asteroid field, the uh, the fact that Ceres is relatively small and doesn't have much mass, and the other fact is that uh, there's just so, so much space in between them. The actual um, volume to density here is just, there you go, That's see, nothing happened. It just bounced off actually, I think. Nothing happened at all. Anyway, so yeah, the density here is very small. So uh, distance between two asteroids is very, very large and a chance of them even coming close is very, 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 very small. And just to conclude, any kind of a mission, any kind of a colony on Ceres would be relatively safe from asteroid collisions. Now, in reality, though, um, there would be about a million of asteroids uh, orbiting here around the sun. I only added 10,000 because I didn't want my computer to slow down too much. But there would be a lot more. And actually, there's a video I made before where I showed a very realistic picture of this sort of asteroid belt. Uh, but nevertheless, a collision on Ceres is still very, very unlikely. And so this planet would be just fine. The only problem, of course, is that it would be a water world. And so we would need to have ships. We would need to bring uh, maybe submarines. And we also have to find a way to essentially live here and uh, 
create things like oxygen and so on and so forth uh, by possibly bringing um, water algae or any other kind of water creatures that can actually produce oxygen for us. Now, the other thing that we're missing here is, of course, the magnetosphere. There is no magnetosphere on Ceres and creating one uh, artificially might be relatively challenging. We could obviously try to use something similar to Venus and create an ionosphere or basically um, atmosphere filled with ions, filled with electrical particles that would maybe bounce off or um, reflect or refract uh, solar radiation that's coming toward us, but that would be relatively challenging. So maybe an, a much easier technique would be to produce magnetosphere artificially by, uh, you know, just making a very, very, very large copper wire that goes around Ceres and creates a sort of a magnetic field that kind of looks like this, but because even if it's one tenth of the strength of the magnetic field on Earth, it would still be enough for us to protect this dwarf planet since it's so tiny in size. And the best part about this uh, colonizable series is that uh, escaping from it and landing back on it is relatively easy. The gravity here is very low, the atmosphere here would be relatively uh, low, uh, it might be about 15-20 uh, kilometers in size. And on top of that, this also creates an opportunity for us to explore these asteroids and also possibly mine them and bring a lot of the mined material back to Ceres. So if we actually complete this mission one day and create a colony here on this beautiful dwarf planet, we might actually benefit from it greatly. And basically that is it for Ceres and for uh, terraforming it. It's not very difficult, all you need to do is basically add atmosphere and create a uh, a greenhouse effect, but unfortunately everything here will become liquid water and you'll live inside an ocean. All in all, this is actually a pretty awesome planet or dwarf planet to live on, especially if you like swimming. Maybe we'll even find a way to create artificial islands by taking some of the asteroids from the outside and bringing them here and just turning them into islands. Anyway, that is it for Ceres and for terraforming this dwarf planet. And before we finish, I just wanted to mention that there is actually a mission that's being planned by the Chinese Space Agency. In 2020, they actually are planning to come back to Ceres and retrieve a sample from the surface of it and then return it back to Earth. This will be the first uh, interplanetary retrieval mission that brings back something really cool to us and it will be actually a pretty awesome uh, step forward for humanity uh, because the Dawn mission uh, that has been launched by NASA a few years ago was only able to uh, explore Ceres from the outside and is also now technically finished. It's not going to be sending any more really cool things to us because I, I believe it ran out of energy. But the Chinese mission gives us a lot of hope and a lot of really cool ideas about what we can possibly do in the future. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. And if you did, like it, share it with your friends and family, and subscribe to this channel where we're going to explore more awesome space things and learn various things by using video games. Thank you so much for watching and game you later. But before we finish, we have to smack something into series to make it melt from the inside. Let's add another dwarf planet and specifically I want to add Vesta. And we're going to pretend that one day Vesta actually does collide with Ceres and decides to join uh, its mass. So let's, let's uh, see what happens when that occurs. So here comes Vesta and we're going to pause this, move this a little bit slower. And Vesta is going to be smacking into Ceres. And we're going to see what happens when that occurs. Uh, Vesta is a lot smaller than Ceres and it actually has, uh, it doesn't have a spherical shape on uh, this game. It doesn't actually portray it very realistically, but it does have realistic mass. And so if they actually collide, this is what would happen. Ceres would... Uh, become completely overheated and molten. It would definitely have a lot of increase in temperature. All of the water on the inside would melt and it would then become an interesting new object. We're going to accelerate time here just to see what it looks like. Its mass would also obviously increase, but not by much. In comparison to our moon, it's still only about 0.3% uh, of the mass. And just so it happens, it just disappeared. I think it overheated to the point where it was way too much for it to handle. And it's gone. So now we have nothing. We have no Ceres, no Vesta, only asteroids. Anyway, thank you guys and bye-bye.